This is Patricia Walter for the Surface Hippie website, and this is August 3rd, uh, 2013, and we're in Columbus, Ohio with Dr. Sue from New York. Hi, Dr. Sue. Hi, Pat. Thanks, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to do this. Well, I appreciate it. Patients like to watch the videos and listen to the doctors. Could we just start quickly, uh, have you do a short summary about when you started to do hip resurfacing and why? Sure. Um, so I'm in practice in New York at Hospital for Special Surgery, and uh, I started doing hip resurfacing in 2004 uh, because I had the opportunity to see one of our faculty who was there a long time ago, Dr. Harlan Amstutz, come and give a lecture at Special Surgery, and he showed us about his hip resurfacing device, his results, and how it was applicable to a younger uh, active patient population. And it really uh, brought out something in me that compelled me to want to learn the technique. Um, I realized that uh, as a joint replacement surgeon, we were seeing lots and lots of younger active patients. And unfortunately, the results with total hip replacement just weren't uh, quite as good in that group of patients. And it left me searching with uh, something more. And hip resurfacing has really provided that uh, solution for those patients. And what device do you normally use? Well, Pat, I've used a few different devices. I've used the Conserve Plus in the past, the Biomet Recap, and the Birmingham Hip Resurfacing. And I would say the majority of my patients um, are with the Birmingham Hip Resurfacing or the BHR. And that's the device I prefer at this point because um, the scientific data from around the world is basically about the BHR and it has the longest track record with the most implantations and that's uh, really what um, compels me to continue using it. How would you respond to the public when they ask, is hip resurfacing safe? Is it okay? Is it dangerous? What about high metal ions? We've seen so much negative media against hip, hip resurfacing. What would you say to a patient? Right, so there are, there are a lot of uh, things that you brought up, all excellent points. Um, what I would say is that hip resurfacing um, is a high performance joint replacement. It's a metal on metal hip replacement or, or sort of uh, artificial hip, it's metal on metal joint. And uh, having a metal on metal joint um, leads to a uh, lower margin of errors. So basically, um, there can be f several reasons that uh, people will produce more metal than we think they should be producing. If it's a good implant, it's put in right, and it's an appropriate patient, then the metal ion level should be low. But any metal on metal joint will produce some degree of metal ions. But um, in a well-functioning hip resurfacing, for example, those are usually in the low parts per bill billion range. So it's a very safe level that we believe for your health. Um, there is the potential to create um, a situation called edge loading where a person produces a lot of metal and that is a situation where they can have pain and swelling around the hip and we're not really sure about the health consequences. So it is something that I feel strongly we should monitor in terms of how much metal is being produced from the hip and how much is in the body at one time. Now, uh, just to go on about uh, the negative media, a lot of the negative media has been around the Johnson & Johnson ASR device, which, as you know, uh, was a poorly designed device and had a very, very low uh, margin for error. So, um, so a lot of those devices, a very high percentage, required revision because um, they were producing a lot of metal and, and those devices have been taken off the market so um, <clears throat> I would say that overall for the majority of patients using a good device and putting it in well hip resurfacing is safe but it does need to be monitored and there are still some situations where a patient could uh, create a lot of metal from their hip. Do you recommend hip resurfacing for women? There's been a lot of uh, discussion, negative media about that. What do you recommend? Right, so uh, another excellent question. I think uh, there's a lot of data 
since hip resurfacing was first introduced, now focusing upon the differences between men and women. Uh, we are seeing that there is a difference in how well they do in terms of the survival rate of the implant at 10 years. So women will have a lower survival rate of their resurfaced implant than women at 10, than men at 10 years, excuse me. But uh, the percentages are still quite good. And there are a lot of factors to tease out as to why that might be. So women have smaller bones, they have more dysplasia, and these things can contribute to a higher failure rate. So I would say um, in a young active woman uh, who may participate in impact sports, has good bone quality, good bone size, I think resurfacing is still a good option. Women in particular are more flexible, they have high range of motion requirements, so they have a higher rate of dislocation with a total hip replacement. And for those patients, I think a resurfacing can be very good. On the other hand, uh, women who have dysplasia, or they have osteoporosis, or they have a very small bone size, then I do think uh, in those patients, a hip replacement could be better. Uh, so each patient's individualized, but uh, it's still something I continue to do for women. There's been a lot of discussion on my discussion group about running. Can we run after hip resurfacing? Can we do high impact sports? What do you recommend or suggest? Um, <laughs> my opinion on that is still evolving as I learn more about my patients and how they're doing. Um, I would say that initially uh, it just made sense to me that the more impact you put on your implant, the shorter it would last, and that's true in hip replacement. But uh, now that I've been doing hip resurfacing for almost 10 years, I have several runners, and uh, some of them long distance runners, marathoners, um, and they are showing me that uh, their hip resurfacing holds up to that kind of activity, and uh, they're able to do it. I think physically, uh, hip resurfacing will allow you to do it. It's the consequences on longevity that I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows at this point, so um, if the patient wants to do it, I try to get them back to that point and tell them how to do it, and we'll have to see about the results. There's been a lot of press about the anterior approach. Uh, I think in general it's been for a total hip. Um, what approach do you use and what would be the difference for hip resurfacing? I use the posterior approach, so posterior approach uh, means we come from the side and the back. And uh, it's, a, it's a great approach, um, which allows us excellent exposure of the hip. Uh, what we've really learned with hip resurfacing is that you have to put the implants in correctly. And to be able to put them in correctly, you need to be able to see what you're doing. So uh, to me and to many of the most experienced hip resurfacing surgeons in the world, the posterior approach is the best because it gives us the best exposure. And I think that's the most important thing for the long term um, recovery and function of the hip resurfacing. Um, if we look at the anterior uh, approach for hip replacement, which I do perform in select patients, um, I think it's a good way to get there and there are many ways to get into the hip. Um, I think it's hard to get the exposure required for um, a resurfacing and I don't think it would make any difference in terms of the recovery. You know, one of the benefits of the anterior approach is that you don't have the restrictions on movement postoperatively. And with the posterior approach that I do, with the repair that you do, we don't have any restrictions either for the resurfacing. So a lot of those uh, purported benefits of the anterior hip approach wouldn't really make a difference with resurfacing. There are some surgeons doing cementless, and I think overseas they are. there are, and there's a lot of discussion which is better? Yeah, um, that's a question that uh, it's going to take a lot of time to answer. Um, I think it's a, a viable technique and uh, that surgeons who have done it have had good results with uh, both cemented and cementless. Um, I would say obviously the, the Birmingham has had the longest track record and that's been a cemented device ever since its inception. So. Um, that has the advantage and it has longer term data. And uh, we've not really seen a femur loosen from the cement mantle. So loosening of that femur doesn't really seem to be a big failure mode for 
the cemented resurfacing. With all the negative media in the last couple years, I think hip resurfacing was not as popular or people were afraid. Do you think hip resurfacing will regain popularity again? And uh, what percent could be resurfacing in the hip replacement? Right, so um, I think that we are seeing basically the tail end of the negative media, I hope. Um, it's uh, something that we've been subjected to uh, over the last uh, several years, but um, we're starting to see increasingly that they're separating out metal and metal hip replacements from hip resurfacings, um, even in the scientific literature. So the metal and metal hip replacements are doing poorer, and people have basically stopped doing those. So uh, in a sense, those negative media and papers have achieved their goal, and the bad uh, procedure and bad implants have kind of been weeded out. Uh, metal on metal hip resurfacing, though, uh, does seem to be gaining in acceptance. They say uh, the metal on metal hips are bad, but the metal on metal hip resurfacings are okay. We're seeing that more and more in meetings. So I think as the negative media decreases and meetings such as this one and more scientific literature about the function of resurfacing increases, uh, we'll see more surgeons getting interested in resurfacing again and hopefully we'll continue to train hip resurfacing surgeons. And I would say, you know, it could probably reach up to 10% uh, of the population of patients with arthritis. And uh, history has shown us in the UK and Australia when it was very popular, it was almost nine to 10% of, of their primary hip replacements. So that would be my hope. Well, I appreciate your comments, and I know a lot of prospective patients will watch the video. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Pat, and I want to thank you for all the hard work you've put into your site and sharing the information that you've gathered over the years to uh, all the patients interested in hip resurfacing. So thank you. Thank you.